I like to preach a message entitled, A Lot of Compromise. Okay, let me say that again. So it's Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, a lot, a lot, a lot of compromise. That's genius. That is just genius. A lot of compromise. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and uh, we, will, we will preach the word. Let me say this before. There's, uh, there's been some folks that have been visiting with us. We're very glad to have you here. I, I feel like, uh, you know, just a little bit of... Um, encouragement. We want to exist for the, the glory of God. We, we want to exist. We know that that glory comes from lifting up Jesus Christ, and uh, we want to do that. And I, I know, I'm sure that you're um, interested in finding a local church that is that way. If I can help you in any way, if you'd like to talk to one of the pastors, we could visit with you. My wife and I come out to see you or whatever. We would love to do that. Just shoot an email to the office on the main um, page of our website, or talk to me afterward, whatever, we can arrange it. But thank you for being here. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, you know that we need you, I need you, and uh, I'm thankful to, uh, to see in the congregation among your people today already spiritual gifts that are used that to encourage each other, to lift us up to the Lord, and uh, what a cool thing it is, Father, that you designed the local church that c- consistently the believers could get together and to keep their eyes upon you and to grow in you while we walk through this journey until we can be with you face to face. Thank you for the singing today. It's good to sing about heaven. Um, Father, I do pray that you would open the word of, uh, to us now. Lord, help us to rightly understand Lot. Help us not to overstep, Lord. I don't want to over push some point. And I don't want to under push some point. Lord, let the word speak for itself. And I pray that you would keep us aware, keep us awake. And when we go away from here, we will know that the Lord has spoken to us. In Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, amen. As we continue the story, our story of Sodom and the plain cities today, I want to show you uh, from a verse in the New Testament something about Lot. You'll remember we spoke last week of the, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it was, a, it was about the judgment of the lost, of those who do, do, don't, do not have Christ, of those who um, are not saved by the grace of God, uh, by putting faith on God's means of salvation, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ and the judgment that is promised. Well, today we are going to learn, go back through the story, and learn from Lot's life, but there is a New Testament verse that keeps us squarely on track, And so it's going to be up here on the slide, the screen. It's 2 Peter chapter 2, 6, and it says this. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, this is God doing it, into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Okay, we see that last week, the, the, the matter of sin being judged. Look at the next part. And delivered just lot or justified lot vexed with the filthy lifestyle or conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds the lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. It's a great, really, overview of Genesis 19 and these two sermons. This, these verses are picked out of the greater context in 2 Peter, but I'd like you just to hone in on the idea of Lot in verse 7, being a just or a justified man by God's grace through faith, and verse 8 calls him that righteous man, that righteous man. I won't go into all the, the details about how an Old Testament believer was saved. They were saved looking towards the Redeemer. We are saved by looking back at Jesus Christ. They were saved the same way you were saved, by the grace of God through faith, okay? Not by sacrifices, not by the laws, not whatever. Abraham is the father of salvation by faith called in the New Testament, and Lot is Abraham's nephew. Lot was a righteous, a saved man trusting the grace of God. Certainly not because of his life choices, right? If anyone, any Christian is ever pointed to, or any person as making poor choices, it is probably Lot. But the Bible says that it's not, it wasn't those day-by-day choices that made him justified or righteous. It is that he received salvation by God's grace. 
And this is important as we go back through Genesis 19 to understand that he was a righteous man. That, it's important in our story of Sodom because the wrath of God falling down on Sodom literally, that cosmic craziness is equal to the mercy that is falling down on Lot at that same moment because he was a saved man. Judgment and mercy, both in Genesis 19. We're going to look at these verses again. Let's read our text, Genesis 19. I'm going to let you be seated. I'm going to read all of the verses, and it's going to take a little bit, but we've got to get, let the word of God speak, not Toby, okay? So let's hear the word. There came two angels to Sodom at even at evening. This is Genesis 19. I'll give you a second. We've been preaching through Genesis origins, the study of Genesis. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, these two angels. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and and ye ye shall arise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did bake uh, unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before uh, they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And I just remind you that is not in a, that is in a bad sexual connotation way. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after them and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. But but behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Craziness. Only unto these men do nothing. Uh, For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. For I am protecting them because they are, you know, my guests. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow, talking about Lot, came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. And the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. This is the angels doing it to the wicked people. So so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out uh, of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake uh, unto his sons-in-law which married his daughters and said, Up, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the, the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, uh, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold of, upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him forth, and set him without the city, or outside the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. That's angel talking. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Let me explain, what the, if you look up here, what this whiny baby was saying, okay? Um, you know, I mean, when God's wrath is coming down on the city, run, okay? Wherever the angels tell you to go, run, okay? That's, that's what you need to know, right? So the mountain was a, a very high elevation. If you look at the topography, and what he is probably saying is that it, it is hard to climb up on the mountain. It's hard to go that journey. It's kind of a rough journey. But listen, when angels are sparing your life, you probably should just go where they tell you to go, all right? 20, behold now, this city is near uh, to flee unto, and it is a little one, he's speaking of Zoar, oh, let me escape thither, is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. 
And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. He says, okay, go to Zoar, I'll grant this. Um, I won't destroy that plain city. That's the one I will spare. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither, till you, till you get out of, this, of Sodom. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little, little one. The sun was risen, risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where, where he stood before the Lord. Here's a great, a great picture we'll go into probably next week. But here's Abraham, just like he always did, worshiping before the Lord. Far, Lot is far from him, from his uncle. But Abraham is being consistent. Verse 28, And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. And he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. He didn't even stay in the city, that little city. He went up dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him for he feared to dwell in Zoar and he dwelt in a cave he and his two daughters and the firstborn said unto the younger our father is old and there is there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth come and let us make our our father drink wine make him drunk uh, and he will lie we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with the, her father, and he perceived not when uh, she lay down nor when she rose up. He was drunk as a skunk. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay down with him. And he perceived not when she lay down, uh, nor when she arose. Thus were both daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son, and called his name Moab, the same as the father of Moabites unto this day. And the younger she also bare a son, and called his name Ben-Benami, uh, the same as the father of the children of Amnon unto this day. I want you to notice, first of all, as we go back to this chapter, and as we think of it from the perspective of Lot, that just man, number one, the choice to move away from a believing community is never a wise choice. The choice to move away from a believing community is never a wise cho- choice. Folks, the, bla- the backsliding of Lot, where did it really begin? We preached through Genesis, and most of you have been here for, for the whole book of Genesis. You know, where did that backsliding begin in his heart and his mind? Well, way before chapter 19, it really stems back to chapter 13. When Lot lived along beside his uncle and worshipped with his uncle, his godly uh, uncle Abram, and then Abraham, that nomad life where they're raising cattle, God's blessing them and their sheep and their cattle, they're all prospering in a great way. There was a community of Jehovah worshipers there around him at that time, walking with the Lord. We even see a little bit of that in 19, where Abraham, just like every morning, gets up and, and appears before the Lord. He goes and worships before the Lord. This is what Lot used to be a part of. This is, this is the community, the, the, can I even say, the righteous community that he was a part of. But remember that there was dic- discord among the, his workers and, and Abr- Abram's workers, and so they, they parted ways. Can I tell you now, from you know, hind- hindsight being twenty twenty, that it was not a good idea? They should have worked that out some different way. Lot was not strong enough to handle being outside of a believing community. And Lot chooses at that point, and we can talk about that some other time, but the land of the plains, he pitched his tent towards Sodom and those five sinful doomed cities. He ends up, as we see, being a citizen of Sodom. I'll talk about the progression of compromise in Lot and in, in, in believers' lives and black backslidden believers' lives in a moment. But from the time Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom and away from the believing community of his godly uncle, we have seen that trouble after trouble after trouble after trouble has found him 
until we arrive at this catastrophic judgment and Lot being a part of it and the whole, the whole chapter ending with his daughters doing what they've done. And it's all, it's all like this perfect storm but that began way back in 13 when he started making decisions to go away from a believing community that could have kept him accountable. God designed the Christian life, folks, to be lived with other saved brothers and sisters around you. You know, the Christian life is not an island. You're not an island in this idea of being born again. So you're born again, and then you're going to do like your own thing, you know, on Walden's Pond or whatever, where you, you just go and you live before the Lord by yourself. It's not designed that way. Who's the designer of churches and local churches? It is the Lord himself. Jesus is the head of the church. It's his idea. Having a community of brothers and sisters around you is necessary for your spiritual health. Anybody can say amen to that? I think we can say solidly that these events in chapter 19 would never have happened to Lot if he had remained under Uncle Abraham's godly influence. Not to mention all that we saw, you know, when he got stolen away and all that. It's just been trouble ever since in our lives. We need our Christian brothers around us to be accountable to, and they to us. We need them to speak truth to us, to worship God together, to rebuke us sometime, to be examples to us and us to them. We need their spiritual gifts. We've been looking at that at the refresh on Wednesday nights. We need their spiritual gifts to grow us. They have something that we need. We can't be solo in this thing. We need spiritual shepherds, pastors, to equip us to do God's work, to study and to rightly preach and divide the word of of the Lord to us. We need it. We need them to feed us. We need them to tend our lives. Some people don't see church membership in Scripture, but accountability to other believers has been right there from the beginning in the book of Acts. This is a privilege and a duty of a Christian community around us. This is the work of the church in our lives. It's not a small thing to Christianity. It's not a small thing to your Christian life. I'm not promoting Lighthouse Baptist Church. I'm not preaching, go to church, go to church, sure. I'm talking about being involved and being accountable and connected to a believing community of believers, and that happens to be called a church. Lot's compromise began when he accepted Abraham's offer to separate And as I said before, I truly believe that they should have found a different solution despite the strife. I preach this to you to realize the importance of keeping godly people around you. This is the church. Maybe you cannot see the immediate benefits, but it is a lifelong thing that will shape all of your decisions and life direction. Hello, Lot. Hello, Lot's daughters. Hello, Lot's wife. Okay, his life was hugely shaped when he went to Sodom. It it, it took a completely different perspective, yet he was a righteous man. He was saved. He He was a believing on Jehovah man. He is in heaven right now. But he made a bad, he made poor choices in getting away from a believing community and and submerging himself in unbelievers, and it took a toll. Being around other believers and accountable to them. It will protect your choices and your direction. Church isn't some brief weekly experience. It is a community the Lord has invented to grow and to shape our Christian lives. So if you're on the fringe of a Christian community, or maybe you're visiting here, or maybe you've come here for a long time, but you're still on the fringe of the Christian community that's even here, jump in. The water's good. And you need it. It's not perfect, never is perfect. There's no church that's perfect. If you found a church out there that's perfect, please don't join it because you're going to corrupt it. Yes, yes. Are we honest about our own lives? Number two, as we look at Lot in this story as a righteous man in Sodom, there is a clear progression of sinful compromise in a believer's life that ends in God's merciful intervention. I want to say that again because there's a lot mixed up into this point. There's a lot, you know, stirred into this point. There is a clear progression of sinful compromise in a believer's life, and this is the unexpected part, that ends in God's merciful intervention, and maybe I should add one way or the other. So this chapter, look please, scan through 19. This chapter is about the judgment of sin, no doubt, but it is equally about the rescue of Lot by God. 
And let's look at that again in 14 through 19, because there's powerful stuff here, and it has direct connection to New Testament believers. 14, and Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place. For Jehovah, that's the capital L-O-R-D, will destroy this city. But, but he seemed uh, as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the, the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot. Come on, Lot, let's go. Lot, come on, we got to get out of here. Saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he, what's the next word? Come on, Lot. The men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful in the hair. You hear that comment? They grabbed hold of him and drug him out, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass uh, when they had brought forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life, the angel says. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest I be consumed. Lot said unto them, O not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy, what's the next word? Mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. And it goes on. There is a clear progression of sinful compromise in a believer's life that ends in God's merciful intervention. Twice, 16 and 19, twice, God's mercy is noted in, the, in, in, in conjunction to him being drug out of that city. Twice, 16 and 19, what is stated as what saved him from the fire and brimstone coming down and destroying him and his family is the mercy of the Lord. The, the angels are literally dragging him out of the destruction Verse 16 is just shocking. He was lingering, lingering, lingering where destruction was coming, lingering after warnings. What are you doing, Lot? Are you crazy? Fire's about to fall. Run, run. But no, Lot has progressed so much in his thinking of being entrenched in a sinful environment, he can't even think clearly enough to run away from God's pending wrath. Lingering? There's no word in, in, in the word of God that's fluff. We're meant to see him like, you know, it's like, I'm not going to say which gender, but it might be the husband or the wife when you're trying to get on a trip and on the road and all those cars are already pa- past you on the highway and you, need, you got five hours to drive and you got to get in a car, honey. I'm going to let you think about which one is not coming in that scenario. <laughs> lingering? Lingering? Brimstone's going to fall from heaven. Sulfur on fire is going to fall from heaven. What are you doing? Listen, you come to a point where you have allowed yourself to be comfortable uh, around sin and sin's influences, and you don't think clearly anymore, believer. I'm talking about I'm talking to Christians. It doesn't seem shocking to you anymore. His lethargy and apathy is so great. The angels literally grab him and drag him out with his family. Verse 16, laid hold on his hand, the Lord being merciful unto him. Drug him out. What mercy of the Lord. Now connect that understanding with the angel's statement in verse 22. Look down there. It says, haste thee, escape thither. Here it is. For I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Okay, do you get what it's saying? He says to Lot, he's under orders. This angel is under orders from Jehovah. All right, the Lord is ready to rain down fire and brimstone. And the angel says, none of that judgment, you got to get out of here. We've got to get out of here. That judgment cannot begin until you, Lot, are out of here. That is a great statement about the difference of how the Lord deals with unbelievers who do not have Christ as Savior in horrible judgment, and how he has guaranteed to hold you fast and protect you, and not, you will never see, you will never see the wrath of God toward your sin, believer. It is, that wrath was absorbed on Jesus Christ when hell was poured out upon him on Calvary. And what a difference there is in how the Lord deals with the saved and the lost, even concerning their sin. 
He says, I can't destroy the city until you're, you're rescued. Get out of here. Come on. He grabs a hold of him. Some of you remember with joy that day when God mercifully drug you out of your sin to receive Jesus as your Savior. And it, it, won't, it was some years before you realized what you, where you were headed and what you would have been. Do you know what you would have been had not the Lord drug you out of your sin and mercifully saved you? Well, I can tell you the end game. You would have been in hell forever and ever. But probably you would have wrecked your life on this earth too. Praise the Lord for his mercy to drag you out. But some of you, even after you came to Christ, there have been times in your life where you, you've messed up, where you've blown it. Christ is your Savior, you're like just Lot, and you get involved in things, and you allow sin around you in your life, and the Lord has got to drag you out again. It's not that he saves you again. You know, we believe, we know the scripture says eternal security. Praise the Lord, because I'd lose it every day for one. But the Lord... When you, a believer, allows himself to become entrenched in sin, the Lord, again, does the dragging. And he will use anything to pull you out because that is not where he wants his dear children to be. It is his mercy that does it. And here, in God's great mercy towards those who have been born again by Christ Jesus, God will destroy and damn the lost in their sin, but he, in his mercy, delivers the saved. And that was the first uh, thing that we saw in 2 Peter. We'll come back to that verse in a little while but it says the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, out of sinful temptations. But he knows also how to destroy and judge sinners that don't have Christ. It's an incredible point. That is, the Lord will drag you out by whatever force is necessary. And he's working in your life right now. If, you're, if you continue to be submerged or like, like, uh, like Lot, allow yourself to be surrounded with sin. He'll chasten you. He'll bring trials. He'll bring sorrows. He'll bring shame. He'll bring embarrassment. He'll bring physical death. And even shockingly, he will bring goodness sometimes to bring you to repentance. The scripture of the New Testament says, it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Sometimes God's method of getting you back on track is he will overwhelm your family with goodness. And so you can only say, Lord, I'm doing this as a believer, and I'm, I'm kind of I'm in a backslidden situation. I'm allowing sin all around me, and yet you're pouring down goodness on my head. I'm coming back. I'm coming back, and I'm going to walk with you transparently again. God mercifully pulls his children out of their sin so they will not face the wrath and judgment that damns the lost. This is theology. It's found in several passages of Scripture. This is the way God deals with his own. God intervenes in our lives with discipline to show that he is our father and, and loves us enough to drag us back from sin. What good father among us, if his daughter, if his son, were to go into the depths of sin, what father among us, good father amongst, would not follow them to the ends of the earth to bring them home? Bring them home. Listen to that truth in a passage about examining your life before you eat the Lord's Supper. Here's a passage that talks about this very thing I'm talking about. It's 1 Corinthians 11, and it says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, an unworthy manner, um, in a sinful manner, or with sin in his life, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Look up here. That word damnation is not uh, the word that we think about about being sent to hell. Certainly no believer is. It is the word judgment. And it's talking about the chastening of the Lord. All right? Uh, to himself not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30 says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. A nice word for dead. 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. The word judge there is the same root word as the word damnation above. But when we are judged, it's talking about the chastening of the Lord to his own, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Do you get that last phrase? We are chastened of the Lord, our Father, so that we will not be judged with the world. The Lord deals with sin, and ongoing sin, in a believer's life, in a lost person's life, two different ways. To the lost, they are headed for hell, an eternal judgment and separation from him. To those of us who have come to Christ as Savior, he guarantees you he will chasten you to bring you back. He will drag you out by whatever means he needs, even if that means his death. 
I'm not being, uh, this is the Bible, okay? It's God's word. This is the reason why many are sick and weakly physically among you and why even people have died prematurely as believers because you won't judge yourself. You will not pull away from sin, but you'll submerge yourself in it. Here you see God's intervention to a child of God living in sin. He brings weakness, illness into life, judges, chastens. He may even take your life if you don't start, start, start judging yourself. And that is the key. That is key, being sensitive to stay away from sin areas. You know, there is no evidence in, in Genesis 19 that Lot was participating in, in sodomy. No, no evidence that he was doing, the Bible says that he was seeing and hearing their sin day by day. He was allowing it to be all around him. He was he, maybe fantasizing, maybe just focusing on it, maybe just being there, not withdrawing himself from it, being submerged in their sin. That's not the place you should be. I said, that's not the place you should be. Amen? Yes? As a believer. This is no small point. It is the mercy of God that shows that we have a merciful father, and that we are not Bible word bastards. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, Hebrews 12 says. The saved receive merciful chastening that will drag you out of sin. Those without Christ receive fire and brimstone, as we see in the story. Sodom could not be destroyed, verse 22, until Lot was out of that place, because that's not how the Lord deals with his children. Let's put the the verses back up there, the last verses, please. The verses on the screen, 1 Corinthians 11, say to judge yourself, Christian, and you will not be judged, you will not be chastened of the Lord. Keep a short sin account. Keep away from sin. Keep transparent before the Lord. These are progression words. This idea is progression of, of of getting involved in sin and and allowing yourself to stay in it for a manner of time and progressing, progressing, progressing. If you let your sin progress in your life without repenting, without killing that sin, God will mercifully but painfully step in. And so is Lot's story. And, you know, sin is very deceptive, and being around sin is very deceptive because God has a lot of patience. And you say, well, I haven't got spanked yet. Yet is the key term there. Please understand, God promises that he is working. He is already working. And sometimes, you know, the, we should be so sen- sensitive that the very gentle chastening, in fact, before ever chastening comes, we should judge ourselves, 1 Corinthians 11, so that the chastening will never come. That's the key. That's the daily living transparently before the Lord. But sometimes the Lord has to begin bringing pressure to you and pain into your life and weakness, and things to get your attention. And some of us, he comes to a place where he has to smack us upside the head with a two-by-four and cut your legs out from under you so that you're so humble that you have to look up and you say, what am I doing? I think this happened a lot when he finally got to Zoar and it says the fear of the Lord returned to him again. And he, 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 he went to the mountain where he was supposed to go the first time. I think he finally understood what in the world he'd been doing. This progression seen in, in Lot's life. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He moves in. He is some sort of representative at the gate. He somehow has progressed in sinful thought in verse number uh, eight to suggest that they rape his daughters instead of him. How far do you have to go being, having sin around you to think that that was an appropriate response rather than, you know, to rape your, the guests in your home that you're going to offer your virgin daughters? That's just demented. This is a believer. This is a righteous man. This is a, this is a Christian Verse 7, one of the telling things to me, if you scan verse 7, is that he calls the wicked Sodomites brethren. Brethren. Now you can say that that's just in, you know, your neighbor, you're waving, hey brother, how you doing, okay? Uh, that's not what was going on, you know, to, um, the, to those who are the people of God. You know, brethren, this is a, a term of intimacy. It's a very sad thing that, that he, he had become to the place and progression of his own sin that he couldn't see who his true brothers were. <laughs> he couldn't see that the righteous of Jehovah were his brothers and he calls the Sodomites brothers. Look again at the verses that I showed you at the very beginning of the sermon in Second Peter. It says, In turning, 
The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemn them, God, with an over, overthrow, making them in sample unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked conversation. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly out of, temp out of temptations. He knows how to drag Lot out and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Look at the wording of, in verse 7 of Second Peter. Delivered just Lot. That's what I've been saying. The Lord mercifully pulls you out, believer, out of your sin. He's actively engaged in that right now if you're choosing to surround yourself in sin. Verse 9, God says he knows how to deliver the godly out of, temp out of temptations. This is what his, this is theology. This is what the Lord is doing. This is what the Lord is like. This is what our Heavenly Father is like. He's not going to let you stay there. He is actively involved in bringing different pressures to bring you out. He is actively, forcefully, maybe painfully trying to pull you out. And let me say, you had better cooperate early in the game or it's going to get tougher, brothers and sisters, for you. Because that's what 1 Corinthians 11 says. Some, some of you sleep. If the Lord cannot be success, successful in pulling you out of being surrounded by sin, he, he, he allows you to die. He takes you to heaven. Because he cannot allow someone with the seed of Christ, the New Testament says, to continue in, in their sin. He cannot do that. He is a good heavenly father. You can't allow that. God is willing to rip your arm off to tug you out of sin. Do you hear what I said? He is willing to rip your arm off to tug you out of sin. He cannot, he will not leave you in the position of the unjust. He is a merciful father. But look at the words of sinful progression in 2 Peter. It says, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now, what is going on? Here is the progression of lot of sin also in our lives if we don't fight and judge ourselves, We stay submerged in it. We see it. We observe it. We hear it. And whose fault is that? Sodom's fault. Our, unwick our wicked environment's fault. Our wicked culture. This horrible America. That's whose fault it is. The, the stuff on the television and the stuff on Netflix and the pornography so available on the internet and blah, blah, blah. It's all the fault, fault, fault. That's what the verse says. Look at the verse again. It says, that man, dot, 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 vexed his righteous soul from day to day. Who is the vexer in the verse? It is Lot who chooses to stay under the environment of sin. Don't blame that on Sodom. He stayed there. It was his choice. Listen, believer, the new covenant of Jesus has been written on your heart according to the word by the Holy Spirit. He has written his laws and his desires inside of you. And, and when you allow to sinfulness to be all around you, you read it, you watch it, you approve of it, you may even participate in it, you fantasize about it, it will vex your righteous soul. And that word vex in 2 Peter means to wear you out with toil and to oppress you and even torment you. It offends, it discourages, it exhausts your saved heart. And I don't think some of us even realize it's happening. I don't think this means that Lot was walking around saying, oh, look how horrible that is. I'm vexed. Or, boy, that's bad. Oh, I can't believe what that those people were doing over there. I don't think that's what it means that he was vexed. I think something was happening internally in his heart, a heart of grace that God had justified. I think it was wearing him out as a believer. It was hurting him. It was tormenting him. It was changing him. It was discouraging his righteousness. I think that that's exactly what sin does to you when you allow it around you. It was causing him to be apathetic. We have to be in the world, brothers and sisters, and we cannot and should not be removed from being light. We're light and salt to sinners. But there is a big difference between knowing sinners and even befriending sinners the way Jesus Christ did and having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness around you. Agreeing to it. Looking at it. Fantasizing being around it, be involved in it, being submerged in it, watching it, thinking about it, meditating it. Lot was way too close. He was way too close for a justified man. 
We are not to be in the middle of sin. And folks, that means leaving some things, children of God, making some decisions, making some hard decisions, some unpopular decisions, unpopular in your family, unpopular to yourself. There are things that I want, my flesh wants. But I gotta say no. I gotta mortify my flesh according to the New Testament. Say no to it. I gotta beat down my flesh, lest I should be a castaway, Paul said. I'm alive to God. I have a new heart. I have to actively remove myself from the influence and the meditation of sin. That means saying no to some things, turning off some things, burning bridges to some things, setting up filters to some things, quitting some things, declaring war on some things. Lot, Lot, you righteous man, why are you still in Sodom? Why are you staring at their sin day after day? I want to show you, show you two possible you know, when you really want to be honest with the Word of God, you've got to be honest with the Word of God. So I would like to, I told Tim Valiente, I'd just like to make Lot a horrible guy, a horrible Christian, backslidden, and you know, God, I'd just like, and then say, amen, let's pray. But there are two happy points, if you can call them. They're very dull, but they're kind of happy, I guess. Number one, there must have been some righteous stand in Lot in that, in that environment, his daughters were still virgins, okay? So there must have been some resistance the second possible but dull point, in verse number nine, when the wicked crowd is arguing with Lot, they say this phrase, this one fellow came into sojourn. It means Lot came into our town. He was traveling, you know, this is how he got there. And he will needs be a judge. So what do they mean, okay? This guy's judging us. Get out of the way, get out of the door. Is this guy gonna judge us? But in, in the Hebrew, that word judge is used in an emphatic way, okay? It's a different kind of way. It's an emphatic way, which some translations say keeps being a judge or always, he's always being a judge to us. There may be some truth in the grammar that, to the fact that Lot had resisted before because they, they say that he keeps judging us. Do you see what I'm saying? Maybe he stood up before. Maybe they knew that he had stood up before. It is very dim light. We sure hope so. There's nothing emphatic in this, except the fact that judges used emphatically. But Lot stayed there. He did not leave, interacting and being surrounded by their sin. You know, the word of God says to us, folks, flee fornication, 1 Corinthians 6. Flee idolatry, 1 Corinthians 10. Flee these things, 1 Timothy 6, a whole list of sin. Flee youthful lust, 2 Timothy 2. Psalm 101 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eye. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cling to me. Okay, God's way for a believer is to flee, not to be submerged, not to be entertaining, not to be bringing into our homes, into our family rooms, into devices, the meditations of sinful things. We cannot separate from sinners. As I said, Jesus was a friend of sinners. But we can refuse to saturate ourselves and entrench ourselves in their sin. Christian, stop vexing your soul. Stop. Separate from sin. Don't continually see it and hear it. Number three, there's a third point I'd like to point out before we land the plane today. Number three, your association with sin influences your family and others. Your association with sin influences your family and others. Even though God had been so merciful to drag him out, we see Lot's selfishness and carnal thinking remaining. In verse number 17, the angels tell him to flee to the mountains, away from the plain cities, but he begs, Lot begs them to send him to Zoar. Okay, the word Zoar, the, the name of the city is Little One. Okay, Little, Little Zoar, same word. Okay, that's, that's what he's saying. So he uses it twice here, and he says, send me to the Little One. Is it not a Little One? Okay, I, I, it's very doubtful that he was talking about population. He's talking about this destruction that's falling. He is probably saying this. The sin, the, the, the population is smaller in Zoar than Sodom, and you're destroying Sodom. This, there's, there's not nearly as much sin in Zoar. Let me go there. It's probably what he's really saying. Boy, that's great thinking, isn't it? Has, uh, has, has Lot really repented at this point? Is he saying the same thing that God is saying about his sin at this point? No, he's trying to, he likes that city life. He likes to be around that city life. It's interesting, though, that somewhere once he gets to Zoar, it occurs to him, perhaps the fire will fall 
well, in this city too, I'm going to, he finally, he leaves there and gets to the mountains. And the Bible says that because he feared that the Lord would destroy Zoar also. Lot's apathy of lingering in sin took a toll on his family. In verse 26, when they're coming out, we blame Lot's wife for looking back towards that sinful lifestyle and that st- sinful city. But can I ask you a question? Who took her, who took her to Sodom? Who led her to Sodom? We look at her, her, she turned around, pillar of salt. By the way, interesting, kind of funny thing, in that area, there, are, there is a lot of deposits of salt to this day. I don't know, I don't get it, I don't know. I'm just saying, it's very interesting. Who took her there, though? Whose influence? It was her husband. It is, it is Lot's responsibility. After Zoar in the mountains in a cave, verse 30, something horrible happens. His two daughters seem to think their chances of marriage are gone. And they hatch a plan. We don't know why they thought they were gone. We don't know at all. But they hatch this plan of getting their father really drunk and committing incest with him. They do it. They both bear children, which becomes, there is some joy in, in Ruth being a Moabitess. But for the most part, these two people groups that, the, that are birthed are enemies of Israel, enemies of the people of God. My point is this. How could their thinking, these girls, become so demented that they thought we will sleep with our dad. How, how could that ever happen? It's because their father had brought them to a wicked city to experience godlessness every day. This kind of perversion was around them every day, and their daddy let them see it, and he, they were part of it. They saw it. This was normal. This was, this was not Uncle Abraham's camp of getting up every day and worshiping, standing before the Lord. This was, this was godless impurity every day and daddy brought them there you had better know fathers that we are responsible for the influences in our families we have got to set up real boundaries and and learn to say no with love in the fear of the lord emma and i made a horrible emma and i made a horrible mistake yesterday we decided that we would ride on the bicycle trail uh, that that starts in on main street in in newark on cinco de mayo de mayo de mayo Potato, potato. There were thousands. I don't think that, I think thousands is the real number. There were thousands of, I'm not exaggerating, you can ask Emma, okay, of mostly naked college kids, um, drunken, parties everywhere, flying, horrible profanity and then we ride over the bridge and they're smoking marijuana. Listen, can I just point out to you, Dad, he's, this is not what the Lord would have believing families to be a part of? To choose that that's somehow okay for our young people? Righteous Lot's story is a story of compromise, sinful compromise that destroyed his family. Perhaps you're a Christian here who has allowed your choices and direction to go way too far. You're vexing yourself day by day in the sin of the world. Do not be confused about the will of God. God is seeking to drag you out of that vexing influence. That is the will of God. To drag you to a life of holiness, to live transparently before him with a Christian community of friends around you that are seeking the same thing keeping you accountable, to separate from intentionally exposing yourself and your family to sin. Here is the way to avoid a lot of compromise, and here is the way to avoid a lot of chastening from your merciful heavenly Father. Would you bow your heads, please?